Hello, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in to our um, Diesel online seminar series this semester. Um, we have three presentations today by me and um, my students, two of my students. Um, Dev is a PhD student started in 2019, and Ryan is a fresh uh, PhD student started this year, co-advised by um, me and Jeff. So for me, uh, my presentation will very briefly overview uh, what metal isotopes can do. Um, then we'll list some analytical services provided by our lab. And then um, Dev and Ryan will talk about uh, their research um, in the Chesapeake Bay and Mobile Bay. So um, as the uh, presentations are going, feel free to type in any questions in the chat window or save them um, to ask uh, verbally later. And we will answer all questions at the end. Um, or even consolidate um, all questions and post them online for you to review. So to save uh, bandwidth and avoid uh, distracting you with my face, I'm going to turn off the video for now and then focus on the um, uh, contents of the slides. So um, our specialty is um, metal isotope geochemistry. Um, metal isotopes are part of the so-called non-traditional stable isotope, um, stable isotopes, to distinguish them from the traditional um, light um, stable isotopes, such as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Um, those light traditional isotopes were measured predominantly um, by gas source spectrometers. And the non-traditional stable isotopes are mostly metals, um, including trace elements. So measurements of those metals were used to be um, invisible because as the mass of the element increases, the variation in isotope ratio decreases and um, become very difficult to measure precisely until the development of this amazing instrument called uh, very multiple lane, multiple collector, um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers. It's non lame as long as a list of elements that can measure. Um, so here are some of the most frequently measured non-traditional stable isotopes. Uh, most of them are metals, including the alkaline metals, um, the alkaline earth metals, transition metals, and some metalloids and also some lanthanides and um, actinides. All of these metals can be measured on this uh, MC ICPMS. So the, um, the measurement of non-traditional stable isotopes have opened a new door um, or a new toolbox for marine and earth scientists, but at the same time, it caused some disruptions to traditional belief and uh, one of the examples is the correction needed for radiometric determination of ages using uranium lead uh, method. So uh, in the past, this method assumes a fixed ratio of uh, uranium-238 over 235 um, to be 137.88. Um, this assumption has recently been overturned because of this uh, measurement of large uh, shifts in this ratio, uh, is this ratio caused by biogeochemical processes that is not related to radioactivity. So this means that some of the ages determined by this method has to be corrected because of this variation of the ratio, including the age of the Earth. Um, the Earth was actually dated to be around 4.56 billion years using this method. Um, another area of application is to monitor the metal contamination of aquatic and soil environments. So here's a figure uh, illustrating the contamination of groundwater by metals. Um, it's typically remediated uh, or treated with a reactive barrier where you put um, reductant into the barrier and then that will remove the contaminant. 
And some of the reductants include uh, inorganic and environmentally friendly metals, such as iron or zinc. Um, or it could be a microbial stimulation by injecting um, some uh, electron donor into the underground and then dormant microbes will wake up and eat them and breathe on those metals. So um, you can measure the water, um, the concentrations in the water to monitor whether the reductive um, remediation is effective or not, but a concentration is not very uh, reliable because sorption and the rainfall dilution can also cause decrease in concentration. Um, in contrast, isotopes um, of the contaminant metal can not only reliably tell whether the remediation is actually occurring or not, um, but also quantitatively estimate how much of the contaminant has been removed. Um, here is an example of chromium. Um, the increase of chromium isotope ratio in this pattern suggests the removal of this carcinogenic hexavalent chromium from the water. And also the exact value of this isotopic ratio can estimate how much of the contaminant has been removed, which is um, very sweet. The third uh, application I'm going to introduce is the uh, um, applications of non-traditional stable isotopes in medical um, sciences. Here is an example of calcium. So because metals, many of the metals are essential elements for human bodies and calcium is one example. Uh, it's a key element in a bone and some people suffer from bone loss, especially the space workers and the calcium isotopes can be used to monitor the bone loss. Um, the idea is that as the calcium is lost from the bone to the soft tissue, the lighter isotopes um, go to the soft tissue faster. So it will be enriched in the soft tissue and go through the um, kidney into the urine to be detected. And then the final application I'm going to mention is the um, reconstructing of the oxygenation history of the Earth's um, atmosphere and ocean system. Um, this area is um, where my current research is focused about. Um, so we know that oxygen is essential for animals. Um, every animal needs oxygen to metabolize. And um, the oxygenation history on Earth is still poorly debated. And this ties to the evolution of the animals. And so understanding when oxygen first appeared is critical. Um, here is a picture showing our current understanding of the oxygen history from the birth of the earth to current. There is a general increase of oxygen over time, but there are many details that we don't understand. For example, when did oxygen start on earth was well, still debated. And that ties to the first appearance of cyanobacteria. So because many metals, like uh, tra including transition metals, they are oxygen sensitive, and there is always large isotopic fractionation during reduction or oxidation, and therefore making them very good candidates to um, read the oxygen history from the book of sedimentary rock. Because there's no gas bubbles preserved in the rock, we can't measure the concentration of oxygen directly. We have to read it from sedimentary through some kind of chemical proxies. Here we use the uranium isotopes to search for the, air, uh, for the earliest evidence of cyanobacteria. Um, uranium is a yes or no answer to oxidative weathering on Earth because the fractionation of uranium isotope ratio requires oxygen. No oxygen, no variation. A simple um, a rationale. So you can see the uranium data increased. Um, the variation or the variance of uranium isotope ratio increased over time from very old to modern. And the standard deviation of this uh, uranium isotope ratio, the, it started to surpass this unfractionated bulk silicate earth. So if, it, if the variation is higher than this threshold, that means there is likely oxygen. Um, so the timing is 3 billion years ago, 
And our conclusion was that um, cyanobacteria um, was likely um, existent on Earth at least 3.0 billion years ago, which is half billion year older than previously thought, because previously, previously thought the oxygen started to rise in the atmosphere at around 2.5 billion years ago. And now we find evidence um, about 500 million years earlier than that. And this has significant implica uh, implications for the evolution of life on early Earth. Um, another case highlighting metal isotope application in tracing Earth evolution is chromium isotopes. And this case, it ties to the animal evolution. Um, one of the big questions um, still not answered is, is life evolution, including animals, um, controlled by external environment factors or internal genetic factors? So the conventional view um, of the Earth's history is that the Middle Age of Earth was very boring. Um, the oxygen was vastly no and highly uncertain. However, during this boring time, some eukaryotes, which is the precursor of animals, evolved during this boring time. But the major diversification, diversification of animals did not occur until the oxygen in the atmosphere rose for the second time to near modern levels. Um, our chromium isotope data correlates broadly very well with the animal evolution in terms of time. Um, inside this boring um, binning period, which suggests that uh, maybe some um, non-traditional stable isotopes can say that um, this boring binning is no longer boring anymore. And this uh, co correspondence or coincidence of rise of chromium isotope ratio and the appearance of eukaryotes and animals supports the notion that external oxygen actually limits the animal evolution. So um, those previous a few slides provided a very, very broad overview of what non-traditional stable isotopes can do to help us understand the biogeochemical processes um, throughout the history of Earth. So here at South and uh, Diesel, we have created a lab that can do analysis on these metal isotope systems. Um, the preparation of these samples need very clean working environment because we're dealing with uh, nanograms of metals, which can be easily contaminated. So two key facilities for trace metal work include a workspace um, that is HEPA filtered um, and particles are removed. And also the second one is uh, very pure distilled acids to digest samples and prepare and purify the elements from sample matrices. Um, metal isotopes nowadays are mostly measured by a, a multi-collector ICP-MS. Um, it provides fast measurement um, with high sensitivity and precision. Um, high sensitivity is mostly due to the efficient ionization of sample by a plasma, which is at a very high temperature, similar to the surface of the sun, to efficiently ionize the samples and convert it into some measurable form. And the high precision is partly due to the multi-collector um, simultaneous measuring of different isotopes at the same time. Um, so the variation, the drifting of the instrument can be, um, the effect of this drifting can be ruled out because everything is measured simultaneously. There is no temporal drift. Um, to the best of knowledge of myself, this instrument is the only one of the kind um, in the state of Alabama. Um, the same instruments can measure a wide range of metal isotope systems from um, as light as lithium and um, to as heavy as uranium. Um, we work on couple of collaborations um, on any of those metals if they are of any use to your research. So um, currently we have methods established for uh, a few commonly used metal isotope systems, including uranium, chromium, lithium, molybdenum, um, lead. And there are several ones coming very soon. 
um, including silicon, selenium, and cadmium. These methods can measure very low concentration of samples because of the low blank levels, almost uh, less than six, six nanograms uh, based on these elements we measure. And uh, the methods can provide um, precise and accurate measurements um, on, on those elements. Um, here are two examples. For uranium, the precision um, is pretty stable over two years period. Um, and the accuracy is uh, very good, consistent with the certified value. Um, and the precision um, is much smaller than the naturally observed um, variations in geological and environmental samples. And the same applies to the chromium uh, measurement. So with that, um, um, I would like to especially thank the USA Faculty Incentive Award and the Marine Sciences Department start a Startup Fund for creating the lab and uh, Diesel providing space and resources to operate the lab and also this um, highly supportive Diesel admin IT and tech teams. And finally, these amazing students who take the chores of maintaining the lab. Um, so there is a new student, um, Joe, who is coming this fall. And currently he is just watching and observing um, to learn all this uh, witchcrafts that is needed to crank out data from these complicated samples. So, um, and with that, I will not take any questions for now, but will later and give the screen to Dev. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you share screen? Yeah, I'm sharing it now. So, Sean, can you please give me your screen? Then I can share my one. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi everybody, good noon, good noon and welcome to my presentation and thank you very much for participating in today's seminar. Uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, the chromium isotope fractionation in estuarine environment uh, based on our current study in Chesapeake Bay and Mobile Bay story. So Sean already uh, introduced me but I'm uh, again just telling about myself. I'm Deborah Tomoli, currently working on isotope geochemistry lab and working under the supervision of Dr. Wang. So before going to the details of my presentation, I want to give you an overview of my presentation. We will discuss a little bit about the chromium isotope geochemistry at first, then uh, about the motivation of my study and methods that we have used in chromium measurement and the chromium fractionation in Chesapeake Bay and chromium fractionation in Mobile Bay. So chromium is a redox sensitive metal, has four stable isotopes, 50 CR, 52 CR, 53 CR, and 54 CR, and have two main balance state, trivalent and hexavalent. So hexavalent is highly soluble and highly mobile. And in a certain concentration, it is toxic, and it is also highly reactive. Uh, on the other side, the trivalent chromium is low soluble, have low sol solubility, have low mobility and low or no toxicity and highly stable. So both of them can coexist together in the aquatic environment. Uh, in different PAs and EAs, they can stay as a oxyanonic species, also the hydrox, hydrox, hydroxide uh, form. So here is the modern chromium biogeochemical cycle. So by the continental weathering, chromium-3 can oxidize to chromium-6 in presence of magnesium oxide. And later, the water-soluble chromium-6 can find the, its way through the river runoff, the estuary to the ocean. In the oceanic environment, chromium can reduce again to the chromium-3 and the 
particle reactive chromium-3 can scavenge to the sediment. And from the sediment, chromium-3 can re-release again to the aquatic environment. Uh, so this is the, uh, the geochemical cycle of chromium. So why, why we study chromium isotope? Because chromium isotope is a redox proxy and chromium isotope can be used in redox evolution of ocean and atmospheric system. So here's the del notion of chromium isotope, which, is, which means the relative deviation between 53CR, 52CR of sample and NBS 979 standard. So here is the figure showing the chromium isotope variation in different reservoir bars on the earth. So here the sediment. In sediment, the chromium del 53 CR value, lowest value is from minus one to highest uh, nearly plus two. In seawater, the del 53 CR lowest value is nearly zero to plus 1.5. In water, river water, and estuary environment, the chromium uh, del 53 value, del 53 chromium value is nearly minus 1.5 to positive 1.6. So our concentration is in estuary environment, that how the chromium isotopic variation is going on in estuary. So why strain environment is important because the global mass balance of chromium isotope is still poorly understood. And the river is the major input of chromium to the ocean and estuary lies between the river and ocean and it can be affect the input of chromium to the ocean. So the key research question of my study is understanding the major controlling mechanism of chromium cycle in estuary environment for example, like how chromium behaving in surface oxygenated water to fully anoxic bottom water. To do our study, we select Chesapeake Bay because the anoxia occurs annually in deeper water of central part of Chesapeake Bay and it extends from May to September. And it causes by the increased stratification uh, between surface and bottom water. So we collected two batches of sample from this point. Uh, the, obviously, uh, yeah, two batches of water sample from this point from surface to bottom, and later bring them to our lab for analysis. And this is the methods of chromium separation. I did not add anything uh, in literature because uh, this is very lengthy, but I can just discuss a little bit about the methods of separation. So we use the magnesium. Here is the figure A is showing the magnesium uh, chromium co-precipitation. And later, after the magnesium chromium co-precipitation, we collect lead from this uh, solution and later perform the iron co-precipitation. Here's the B is showing the iron co-precipitation co of sample. And later we remove iron from the sample using anion exchange column. And after performing the anion excess chromatography, then we purified chromium using the cation exchange chromatography. And finally, we took the chromium, purified chromium for MCI CP MS analysis in our Neptune is uh, already shown by Sean. So in our study area, we found that DO is uh, gradually decreased from surface to bottom. And after nearly, nearly 14 meter of depth, DO goes to the zero, nearly zero from up to 25 meter. <clears throat> Slightly gradually increased from surface to bottom uh, from like five PPT to nearly 20 ppt. And concentration of chromium uh, slightly decreased over the depth 
uh, from surface to bottom. And delta 53 CR value remained positive from surface to about 14 meter of depth, depth and after 14 or 15 meter, uh, the chromium isotope fractionated negatively here. So this is have a very good relationship with the DO, where DO is higher from surface to the level of, from surface to 13 meter, it seems that the chromium isotope fractionated positively. When DO goes nearly zero, the chromium isotope fractionated negatively. Here's the relationship between chromium concentration and salinity, which is showing a negative linear relationship and indicating the simple mixing of fresh water and uh, seawater. Here, chromium concentration also have a positive linear relationship with DO, which is indicating the reduction of chromium uh, in current study area. Yeah, del 53 cr also have a negative linear relationship with salinity, which is indicating the simple mixing of fresh and saline water as well, and have a positive linear relationship with DO, also indicating the reduction of chromium in this environment. We compared our result, the del 53 cr and long cr ratio with the global data, which is all collected from the oceanic environment like Arctic Ocean, Southern Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, also the Mediterranean Ocean and Baltic Ocean. So in the oceanic environment, the, this relationship is, uh, is negative and linear relation, but we got a positive linear relation with del PPC here and long here. Uh, so, because we performed our study in a sterile environment and all of those studies performed in the oceanic environment. That means the oceanic environment and sterile environment is uh, chromium cycle in these two environment is different. So here is the flow diagram that how we think that how chromium cycle is going on. In the, in the surface oxic order, chromium six is dominant which is really reducing in the boundary of oxic of anoxic water. And after reducing to chromium three, chromium three is exporting to the anoxic area and redissolving again and staying in the, uh, in the solution. So a little bit, a little portion of uh, chromium three is scavenging, but most of the chromium three is staying here in anoxic bottom water. Uh, and that's why we're assuming that probably the concentration in bottom water is dominated by chromium-3. Oops, sorry. Uh, the concentration, CR concentration in bottom water is dominated by chromium-3. As it is, the stratification is going on, the water is not particularly mixing and the anoxia is going on. So this condition is staying for a long time and The, the, the del 53 here in positive in surface oxygenated water and in bottom water del 53 here is negative. So this is, this is how we think that the chromium cycling is going on in our current study location, but for better understanding, we need to do a measure the chromium six and chromium three separately that we did our current study in Mobile Bay. We collect surface water sample across the slide gradient from 16 station, from station one to upstream station 16. And we did uh, the calculation, we, uh, we, did the measure, we did measure the chromium three and chromium six separately. In result, we found that the chromium-6 and chromium-3 is reversely related with the uh, salinity uh, gradient. Like in high salinity zone, 
chromium-6 is dominated and it's gradually decreased with, uh, from downstream to upstream, where salinity is uh, decreasing from downstream to upstream. In reverse, chromium-3 is increasing from downstream to upstream when the salinity is decreasing from downstream to upstream. Here's the ratio of chromium-3 and chromium-6. So which is mean that chromium-3 is uh, decreasing in oceanic environment in high salinity zone rather than low salinity upstream uh, river in our storing system. So in conclusion, we want to say that in, uh, in anoxic estuary environment chromium-6 can be reduced to chromium-3, but significant chromium-3 can stay in the solution. And the proportion of dissolved chromium in river and estuary water is higher than open ocean, likely related to dissolved organic matter complexing with CR3 and render it soluble. Thank you very much for, uh, for your kind uh, attention to my presentation. I, I'll ask Ryan to start the next session and we'll took our questions at last. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, right? Um, so, as they said earlier, my name is Ryan Roseborough. Um, I worked last year as an REU student um, with Dr. Wang and finished up the REU project that I did last year um, this summer um, in chromium isotope geochemistry, um, specifically in the Mobile Bay. Uh, so my motivation was to test chromium pollution levels from both the Barry Power Plant and Industrial Park, as well as investigate chromium isotope systematics across a salinity gradient, um, specifically in oxygenated estuary environments um, versus dev study that was done in anoxic environments. Um, and to determine whether chromium is a conservative element in the Mobile Bay estuary. Um, so my sampling locations took us from the Barry Power Plant to the Sea Lab, um, covering over 100 kilometers of water. Uh, we took sediments, uh, surface sediments, and surface water samples at all locations um, along the salinity gradient. Um, so my methods were to for the sediments to freeze dry um, the samples and then dissolve them with hydrofluoric, nitric, and hydrochloric mixed acids. Uh, we then further separated the authogenic component um, with aqua regia and the residual detrital component of sediments with more hydrofluoric acid. Uh, water samples were filtered and then chromium was extracted by co-precipitation with iron hydroxide. I did not use magnesium hydroxide as DEV did. Um, after that, anion and cation exchange column chromatography was used to purify chromium for the isotope analysis on the mass spec. So I want to begin talking about my results by saying that there were no major sources of contamination, of chromium contamination. Um, the EPA regulations are 100 part per billion chromium um, for drinking water. And all of our uh, concentrations were below five part per billion. So there wasn't anything to be scared of or anything. Uh, chromium concentrations in the filtered particulates um, as well as dissolved in the water decreased with salinity as you can see by this graph. Uh, whereas the Delta 53 chromium um, increased in the dissolved water samples, um, but slightly decreased in the particulates that were filtered out. 
there are two possible hypotheses that can explain these patterns. The first is that chromium-6 is reduced to chromium-3. Um, and in this process, light isotopes are lost to the particles in sediment while heavy isotopes remain in solution. Uh, the other hypothesis is that there is just simple mixing between the two end members of river water and seawater. So the first hypothesis is the reduction model. Um, Dev pointed at this earlier, but the reduction of chromium-6 to chromium-3 will lead to a linear relationship between the fractionation of chromium and the natural log of total concentration, um, which was observed up in the Connecticut River estuary system. Uh, but our data did not conform to this model. Um, it was very nonlinear um, and clumped. So we decided to look at the end member mixing model um, and simple mixing between our two end members of river water and seawater um, is consistent with our data. Uh, the Mobile River water is high, has high concentrations of dissolved chromium um, and low concentrations of uh, fractionation, whereas the Gulf of Mexico is opposite in both of those. Um, and our data did fit a fairly linear relationship between those two. Um, now to discuss my sediment samples. Uh, Chromium is very reactive, so it is usually normalized to titanium, which is considered non-reactive. Um, so in the bulk sediments, uh, our, the ratio of chromium to titanium increased with salinity. Um, this also gives two possible hypotheses, um, that there is chromium enrichment in the sediment towards the bay as the salinity gets higher, or there is no chromium enrichment because the ratio is similar to the average continental crust value um, across the world is considered to be about 0 0.024. Um, and the increasing trend is merely due to proportions of sand, which hold low concentrations of chromium, um, and mud, which contain high concentrations of chromium. The key to distinguish these two hypotheses is to know the ratio um, in the original detritus of the catchment or this area. Um, so to do that, back in my methods, we separated the detrital and orthogenic components of the sediments by leaching the sediments with different acids. Um, once we did this, we found that the detrital component um, had consistent chromium to titanium ratios across the salinity gradient, but they were all lower on average than the average continental crust, while the orthogenic uh, component had much, much higher um, on an order of magnitude of 100 uh, higher ratios than those two. Um, so we concluded that chromium is enriched in the estuary sediments, um, just not by detrital components. Um, so delta 53 chromium in the orthogenic component is also slightly higher than the detrital components. Um, we concluded that the isotopically heavy chromium is likely derived from dissolved chromium, uh, which mainly exists as heavy chromium six, uh, which is up in these areas. Um, however, the dissolved chromium 53, the dissolved delta 53 chromium versus natural log um, did not support our reductive sequestration of chromium um, as shown previously. Therefore, we suggest that chromium is removed from pore water um, and enriched into the sediments below the sediment water interface. Um, to compare this estuary to other environments, um, I wanted to look at specifically the difference between my samples and dev samples. Um, so the Mobile Bay water is fairly oxic, whereas Chesapeake Bay is redox stratified. Um, so we proposed that in an oxic estuary, dissolved chromium concentrations and delta 53 chromium is dominated by conservative mixing between the river water and seawater. However, um, there is some component of orthogenic enrichment um, of chromium from the pore waters to the sediments. 
In contrast, um, the anoxic estuary environments, um, similar to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the reduction of chromium-3 to chromium-6 occurs in the anoxic water column, and the reduced chromium-3 can stay in solution due to possibly complexation with dissolved organic matter. Uh, so this concluded my REU project from last summer and finishing up this summer. Uh, now as a PhD student, um, I'll be working under both Jeff Krauss and Sean um, to use lithium and silicon isotopes um, to study the effect of reverse weathering uh, on the silica budget in the ocean. And I am definitely still in method development. So I don't know much about this project yet because I just started a couple weeks ago. Um, but that's all I had. So I think now Sean will probably take over, but we'll probably open it up to questions for everybody. So thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Dev and Ryan, for giving very great uh, presentations. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, uh, almost uh, 19 minutes for questions. Um, Ruth is asking, do you know how the bioavailability of the different forms of chromium change with salinity? Um, so I'll, I'll take a first um, try um, to answer this question. The chromium, um, it, the chromium three is not very soluble under circumneutral circum pH. Um, so as Dev's data shows, as the salinity goes to high values toward the ocean, the chromium three um, decreases. So there's less uh, chromium three um, into the ocean as the salinity increases, which means the bioavailability decreases. Um, in terms of, of chromium-6, because chromium-6 is toxic, um, the, um, the life organisms probably will try their ways to avoid that. So many chromium-3. As you go to higher salinities, chromium-3 decreases. Does that answer your question, Luth? You're welcome. Sure. So if you don't have any questions for now, um, because Angela is going to post the video online, um, we can also um, answer the questions there if you think of any questions later. Okay, here's a question. Can both isotopes bind to organic matter? Um, how may this affect the isotope fractionation? This is a great question and also a great question and it's not well understood. Um, chromium uh, complexes with organic matter very, very significantly while uranium um, has less complexation with organic matter. And the uranium in the ocean, there's only one species That's the uranium-6. And the complexation between chromium-3 and organic matter actually fractionates chrom uh, isotopes uh, pretty large in the laboratory. There is about one per mil-ish um, when the chromium-3 is uncomplexed with organic matter. However, in the natural world, the, the, um, the isotope effect during complexation with the organic matter is not well understood. And based on the samples we have measured, such effect, such isotope effect is very small in natural um, samples. 
because if you remember the if you remember the, the, the graph, I'm going to share the screen again so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, here it is. And share the screen. Okay, so um, the screen shows the delta chromium, delta values of chromium three over geological time if the complexation with chromium-3 is very significant and causes significant isotope fractionation in the natural world, we would have seen a lot of much more fractionations up to one per mil throughout this Earth's history when there's microbes producing um, organic matter. And we now we have microbes since Archean, so we don't see these large fractionations, um, and that means the isotopic effect of complexation on chromium is not that big in natural world as we see in laboratory. Okay, um, Kelly has a question. Uh, chromium-6 is the toxic form. Is it also the bioavailable form? Um, is it more available in the ocean environments? Um, yes, uh, chromium, the hexavalent chromium or chromium-6 is the toxic form. Um, it is the available form and the molecular structure of chromium-6, uh, which is cro chromate, by the way, um, CrO4 with two minus charges, is the very similar to sulfate. So sometimes this life organism take chromate as, um, as sulfate, and then- um, Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So it is, the, it is, it is bioavailable, but the, the life organisms uh, will try to avoid that. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's the chromium-3 that is essential for life. It has something to do with the metabolisms of, uh, of sugar um, in the cells. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Right, another question coming from Alex. Um, he says, the cyanobacteria on Earth's surface 0.5 billion years uh, earlier than expected. Um, this could be, um, this, this will extend uh, my topic. Uh, there's a lot of data coming um, soon. It's still in the pipe of the publication. Um, it could be either, it could be on land, like uh, lakes, freshwater lakes, the microbial mat can grow um, in the lakes, as well as shallow oceans. Um, it's probably not on the land, because on the early earth, there was no trees, there were no shrubs or any vegetations. The UV is very harsh on microbes, they probably won't grow on bare rocks in Arkin. Yeah, no, no ozone too, yeah. So it's probably in a fresh water lakes, it's possible because we found the fractionation of uranium isotopes in both uh, locustrian sediments and shallow marine sediments. You're welcome.
Okay. Um, again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, publish uh, your questions on um, in the online thread, and then we'll try to answer your questions there. We should also try to um, organize these answers to these questions asked here, and then post them together with the video online for public view. And with that, um, thanks again for tuning in for this seminar series. Um, we will. Um, we will advertise future uh, seminars ahead of time as well. Thanks. Have a good day.